Whenever you're online shopping through your favorite businesses, whether that be Allo or Gymshark, and you get the rush of adding something to your cart and heading to checkout, so rarely do you ever think about the business behind the business. The business that makes selling so easy and for shoppers, buying so easy. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. It is home of the number one checkout on the planet. With ShopPay that boosts conversions up to 50%, meaning there is way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going up. So if you're into growing your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell whenever your customers are scrolling or strolling on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more, sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout as Gymshark uses. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash sonoro, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash sonoro to upgrade your selling today. Shopify.com slash sonoro. Are you ready to turn your best ideas into a thriving online business? Introducing Shopify, your no excuses business partner. You might not realize, but our podcast, More Than Mammies, it's a business. And we started it, of course, to talk about maternity, not to become an e-commerce expert. So yeah, we needed some help selling our merch and getting our start up and running. Another sale. Shopify is a commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. No matter if you are a garage entrepreneur or a big business, Shopify is the only tool you need to start and grow your business without the struggle. With a Shopify single dashboard, you can manage orders, shipping, and payments from anywhere, giving you the insights you need wherever you are. Sign up for $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash sonoro or lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash sonoro to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash sonoro. Welcome to another episode of the Brown and Black Podcast. My name is Jack Rico. And I'm Mike Sargent. And every week we take a look at race and pop culture through a brown and black let's we are here with author regina porter who has a new novel called the rich people have gone away that takes place during the pandemic regina first we want to welcome you to brown and black oh it's nice to be here nice to meet you guys thank you there are a lot of things about your novel that are striking and very memorable to me. And you start the book with a poem, and a lot of your writing seems almost like prose. Sometimes you place the sentences or the word off-center. And I'm wondering for you as a writer and a former playwright, how prose and your use of words came about and maybe what that means to you as a writer. Is that something that you go for? Or is that just something that comes naturally out of you? I think uh, for me as a writer, I started out writing poetry. It's the medium in some ways that I respect the most because poets are excellent at saying a lot with very few words, and I, I admire that. My mom, I learned as an adult, wrote poetry as a kid, and so I probably get a little bit of that ear from her and just listening to how folks spoke down south where I'm originally from. Regina, uh, this is your second book. Anytime anybody gets into writing a book, a novel uh, like this, you're invested in it. You're committed to it. I have to get this out of me. It's haunting me. What is it about this story, Regina? That was so important for you to say. Well, you said haunting. That's a very good word. I'd almost even say stalking. I was working on another book when the pandemic hit. And I said this a couple of times. I went over to run an errand in early April in Park Slope. And I was just shocked by how quiet and eerie and still it was. There were just not a lot of people out except 
homeless people or people like me running very specific errands. And I had this, uh, I, I don't know what kind of moment where you, I, I can call it other than I'm aware of running my errand and going back to my safe home. And I see another African-American woman, she's homeless, she's out of her mind. And she says, I'm wearing a mask at this point. She even comments about my wearing the mask. And I wish she had a mask on. And I, I really felt for her. And I went back and I just, I couldn't focus on the book I was going to write. It just didn't have, the pandemic just kept bothering me. And I couldn't figure a way in. I knew she wasn't because she was not mentally all there. And so it would have been hard to do her justice and grace in a way that's important to me. I kept trying to put it out of my mind. And, but the idea you have to address this in some way kept stalking me. And then the character of Theo came and I thought, this is interesting. And his, his fondness for it's, I don't know if it's a spoiler, having sex in doorways and how a pandemic would disrupt that. And I thought, okay, I think I have my, because what people may relate to is COVID really disrupted our lifestyles and it made us stop and pause and it locked us in. And a lot of us couldn't run away from race and class in the way that we can uh, when a city is functioning like it normally does. And you can stay busy and not think about what's going on with the rest of your neighbors and by neighbors, all of us New Yorkers. Yeah. I'm a little fascinated by your process and, as you say, those characters. And when we meet Theo right away, we know, let's just say, some of his flaws. Yeah. He's got a complex ethnic background. A great writing teacher once said that character is story. Yeah. Because I think this premise with different characters of story could have gone very differently. How much did these characters start to inform the story and the story inform the characters and the things you wanted to say? The characters totally led the story. I, when I look back, I, I'm not someone who plots. I, I generally follow character. But when I look back at the first chapter, I think, which is called Daily Cleanse, I thought, huh, that's interesting. Structurally, I put almost every major character in that first chapter chapter. So on some level, some part of me that I don't know that I don't want to think about too much, I don't want to mess with it, knew where I was going, even if I didn't know where I was going. Do you know, if you think about it, Maureen, Ruby, they're all there. And in that first chapter, and so, it's, so that must be some part of my process that I have internalized, but I'm not overly analytical about it because if I think too much about it, then I'm going to try to force certain things to happen. I want to talk about Theo Harper because I think any person of color that has experienced upward mobility is Theo Harper. I want you to three-dimensionalize him for me as a microcosm of the many people of color who are ambitious, who are successful, who are talented, who are skilled. And that when the pandemic hit, it exposed all these racial inequalities, the financial inequalities. But then Theo represents symbolically all of this. Mm -hmm. And as a reader, I wanted to ask, if you're a person of privilege, how are you supposed to see Theo? And if you're a person who is a working class person with aspirations, but there just aren't any and you're closed in, how do you see Theo? Well, I think people of privilege and if you have money to travel and if you don't have to worry about finances or being homeless and you know where your next meal are, you do have, we all have a degree of privilege. And then it, how much privilege, that's a different question. What fascinated me about Theo was Theo doesn't feel guilty. <laughs> he doesn't. And that was a very interesting. And can I tell you, as a person of color with a degree of privilege, freeing and terrifying character to write, because I thought this man does not really, he's very comfortable not feeling 
guilty and I let guilt <laughs> do you know influence my life it could I can't sit and eat a meal and then see someone struggling walk by and ask for and just ignore it and I think Theo would be perfectly fine with that but the pandemic shifts that so it's grappling what do you do with guilt do you know what do you do with guilt ruby for example takes that guilt and starts feeding people mm -hmm. i don't know that theo feels that level of responsibility and not everyone does and this is going to be an odd thing to say if it's not coming from the right place maybe not everyone should i couldn't there's no universe in which i could have theo turn around and all of a sudden chain it just was not realistic but i could possibly have a moment where another african-american male that he saw as a threat he has this moment of oh i see you <laughs> that's progress for theo do you know realistically this novel of course has been compared to the talented mr ripley and you wrote it during the pandemic and if this didn't actually happen, this novel would be considered speculative fiction, almost science fiction, because science fiction often was talking about the human condition. Reading this novel really brought me right back to that time and all the odd things that you think and the things you never considered before. As a writer, do you, do you think you could have written this not during the pandemic, maybe five, 10 years later doing reference, or do you think hmm. the pandemic, because that's the milieu, really helped make sure you got what you wanted to say or got that time period? Well, first, I'm sorry. Uh, first off, I really resisted writing it because I didn't want it to be a pandemic, a quote unquote pandemic novel. And I was trying to find a way in where we see the characters as human beings and some of their behavior being, look, I think these people are who they are. The pandemic just intensifies and highlights their strengths and weaknesses a lot more and, and forces some of them up against the wall where they have to address certain things about their lives and relationships. So the short answer is that I really try to tell the story like there wasn't uh, pandemic, but the pandemic informed everything and it's still informing our lives, right? And there's some great old movies. I want to say The Third Man or whatever, where. Well, um, yes, where you have the backdrop of war, or, or but these people are living their lives. And I watched a lot of my father loved old movies. So I like, I watched a lot of Westerns and old movies with my father. And I think some of that echoes in the writing, the way that you have this backdrop and the suspense in this world. That's my, my gift from my mother is an ear from, for poetry. And my gift for, from my father is an acute visual sense and a sense of, and I know Westerns, which is very complicated, but it might be something like, oh, say high noon, Gary Harper, mm -hmm. Gary Cooper was dying of cancer when he shot high noon. So my father would say he was dying of cancer when he shot that. So the intensity, so there's that double layer of what's happening on the surface and what's happening beneath. And I think that actually helped me as a, a writer, you know, what's going on, what's the character doing up front and what's the character doing internally. To me, I felt that the pandemic was almost like a character yeah. in the mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. because it was so influential. Yeah. I wanted to talk about morality, the morality of the decisions that the characters in your book are making, because I think morality is something that today doesn't signify what morality used to mean in America at one point. Yeah. And I feel that we have lost a lot of morality. So for example, you know, I always, I'm always telling Mike, it's like morality doesn't exist anymore, in my opinion. And Mike would ask me like, how? And I said, okay, you have a boss of a company who wakes up in the morning and he kisses his wife on the cheek hugs his kids, eats with his family, and walks out the door to provide. And so you think he's a great moral man. And then he gets to work. 
and he checks his morality at the door. And then he goes to town on everybody and dehumanizes them. So I started thinking about morality and how fluid it is. So as an author, how much was the moral compass of all of these characters important to you? That's a tricky question because I try not to impose morality on characters. And as I said, Theo could be a challenging character for me to write at times because, and I just let him go and rip and do what he, he was going to do and be who he was. It's not my job to pose my morality on the uh, characters. I would say like in terms of foil or counter, say Irvin, even though has the father of the teenager in the Cardi B t-shirt and Nadine, they, I think, are moral people. And an example of when we ask how one uses privilege, I think there's a scene in which they get a group of kids together and they have the kids work and study together. That's the way of, they bring that community because Irvin was raised in an environment with, where community was important. So he's doing what his grandmother taught him. And I think, okay, I, there are echoes probably of my grandmother in that character, do you know, or my grandmother in Nadine, do you know? So their value system is different. I try not to say better because Theo came into the world with his own experiences. Everybody you meet, I'm meeting you today, you've had a lifetime, however old you are, to be become who you are. And so if I meet you, and this is how it is with a character, I'm meeting you as you are today. And my job as a writer, when uh, I'm writing you, is to start from where you are today and let you reveal to me what I need to tell the story and go, oh no, oh, okay. <laughs> That's how, how I approach it. You know, it's interesting because the climactic point is whether he is going to leave the city or not. And, and, and yeah. I won't spoil anything. Yeah. But that's a decision made on morality. And how does the history of racism, the history of class, the history of my skin color being interpreted by another dominant group how does that affect my decision making and how does my morals at that moment make me go or make me stay? Well, now, as far as leaving the city, I, I think that if, and this is not a giveaway, Theo would not leave the city if he lived alone. He's married and he has a pregnant wife and they have a summer house and things would be even testier than they are between them if if he stayed. The question you're asking, that's part of a larger question around with Theo, I think he's sitting and he's watching television, which I don't think he's someone who would typically watch a lot of television. I don't think his mind works that way in the news. And he's having to make sense of, we forget, unless we were living here, so many people died. Doctors had to make horrible decisions about who would live. A lot of brown people, brown and black people died. And I think it's in that moment, if you're asking me as a, a writer, it was in that moment where I think Theo starts to have dis-ease and start to go, starts to go, wait, bodies all, wait, why are there no ventilators? And why? And I think that makes him really uncomfortable. And that, set, and that creates a kind of agitation because he identifies as he's white presenting. And I think a lot of people could argue, he's white. I don't see what his issues are. He's a, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? That, so there are all of these complications and he has to sit in his body and deal with them. But in terms of a larger, a larger philosophical question, because you're asking me some heavy philosophical questions here, and I'm going to say I'm just a writer, I'm not a philosopher, and you're in a little bit of the, the soul of Black folks' territory too. Most, how do I want to say this and not get in trouble for saying it and be very mindful and accurate? You can, look, we can even 
so many successful people of color, I'm going to say people of color, suffer from that this feeling of not belonging or made to feel almost, it's almost, we get schizophrenic messages that we internalize about success, which is why I believe sometimes personally someone becomes very famous and then they overdose or whatever. How do you, because sometimes you succeed, but you're leaving people behind. And we can say again, again, and again, it's heartbreaking, right? These stories, there's a reason that we see these stories and people are not able to coexist with their wealth and their worthiness. That's your wealth and your worthiness. Those things are always in opposition. And I think, I don't think about themes when I'm writing, but certainly Theo's wealth is in, it comes into conflict in some ways with his worthiness, which ironically, Darla never doubts that she is worthy, ever for a moment. And that was very interesting to see. Even at her, she never doubts that she is worthy. And that was a very interesting point of discovery for me for later with her friendship with Ruby. At some point, this will actually be considered a historical novel because it takes place at a very specific time in history. Your last novel took place in various times. You seem to really enjoy giving details of a time and place in your writing. I got a very vivid picture of where he lived in Brooklyn and what he's seeing and whatnot and upstate. So I'm wondering about these time frames of human existence and whether it's the old West or the pandemic, different things, like you said, will be amplified. Mm -hmm. So I just want to know your thoughts on time and why you enjoy, it seems to me, writing about different times, what, what you can do there. I don't know that maybe I don't have a clear answer for that. Stories come to me and I don't always know how they're going to come. Or I wish I had more control <laughs> over how they're going to come and or appear, if it's going to be through a visual moment or through something I hear. But I will say, I think music, music plays a role, right, in the way I write. And there's maybe a musicality sometimes to it. And I do listen to music when I write. And music is very time specific. And music can land you in place emotionally, right? Like I tell students, a song can be anything when they come and say, how... I want to write this, but I can't. And I said, if it's a song, like a song can be anything, right? It can be 14 minutes long. It can be two minutes long. So a pro and a song has a beginning, a middle, and an end, right? And has bridge. So how it, it depends on how you play with time. So sometimes say, I did, I listen to Dexter Gordon. Right. I listened nice. to I listened to some of everyone. I listened to Kenny Rogers. I listened to and I listened to every I listened to a lot of Prince, Sign of the Times. I just listen and and you get there's an immediacy in a song, right? They don't have like poets, right? They use their words very their lyrics very clearly and to cut through a lot of mm, mess that you can get stuck in that distracts from story. Between The Travelers and also this book, mm -hmm. there are a lot of similarities in the subject matter. Privilege, place, generations, differences in those, the nuances of each. Mm -hmm. What is it about these subjects that draw you back to writing them over and over again? Mm. I don't know. I live in New York and we liked class is very important. And I also think a lot of times when we're talking about race, we're really talking about class. And sometimes I feel like it's a real slight. And that's where that sort of schizophrenic thing comes in again. We, it, and every four years, <laughs> it comes to the forefront. And I feel like, oh, my gosh, I'm in a kind of I, I don't know. And it's like deja vu because we're really sometimes talking about class. We really are when we're talking mm. about race and we're talking about race. Sometimes when we're talking about class and I think it manifests in different parts of the country in different ways. But one of the things I and this may help when you talk about the morality code, 
Theo does not like it when people put down where he comes from, even though he couldn't live there. And he's brutally honest about certain things. Like when he says, if someone asks you where you live, what school you your kids go to, there's a point where he just comes up with a list of things. His understanding of class and how it plays out is very nuanced. And I think also... I see that over again and again, the little interplay, even on the subway or whatever, there are always these sort of little dramas that are happening and I and they fascinate me. I don't think I've ever had a character who is an aesthetic advisor. And I felt that was somewhat metaphorical to who and what he is. He presents a certain way, but there's an inner life we don't know about. His wife is a bassoonist. These are unique jobs, but they also say something about the characters. Is that something that comes to you or were there things that, so if I have this, I can do this? I'm a big believer. I tell students, I said, you have to give your characters jobs. A stay-at-home mom, that's a job. You have to, and one of the telltale signs, often too, if someone has a trust fund, is if they write something and they have no concept, they're not thinking at all about a job. So even if you have a trust fund, you that's a job, your job, you have to live off your trust fund. So I'm really, I am I believe that you give your characters jobs. I forget there was a, another writer who said that, and I believe that very strongly. And that helps ground me in character and say, being a bassoonist, that's an understanding of personality because she's just a little itty bitty thing, but a bassoon, you open it up, it's eight feet long. And so this is where the craft comes in. That means she's going to have to be strong, that physically flexible, that comes in later in terms of plot, but also the bassoonist is called the clown of the orchestra. Do you know? So that was a way to understand her character. Many years ago, I met someone only for a minute and they said they were an aesthetic advisor. And I thought, (laughs) what is a, it has to be over 20. And this is how long things like take to play out. And so when I was doing research, I reached out to a friend, a real estate uh, agent, and I said, have you ever heard of an aesthetic advisor? And she goes, not in my entire career as a a real estate agent. I, I don't know. And I said, I'm going to use this because someone said this over 20 years ago. And I thought, (laughs) <laughs> and yeah, but I had to, I couldn't, I don't think <clears throat> Theo approaches it as being pretentious because I think another thing to his credit is he has a very strong work ethic. So these are the things where I give him morality, his work ethic, his, mm. he may not like everything about his coming from Iowa but he will not put up with someone from New York putting his hometown down. He has pride. He can see the flaws in things. So these were my efforts to humanize him because he's a difficult character. I wanted to go back to that Cardi B remark that you made. Uh, Xavier, the black teenager who's in the building during this whole pandemic issue, he's wearing a Cardi B t-shirt. How do you see pop culture shaping the narrative of these characters in your book? Um, Well, first with Cardi B, I don't think Cardi B cares what people (laughs) think of her. And I have respect for that. I respect like when she, these are red bottom, these are bloody shoes. I don't dance now. I make my... When she sings those lines, I get goosebumps. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't dance now. I make blood money moves. She says it with such conviction. And I don't think when I talk about a certain freedom, she has her flaws. And I'm sure people have written or will write and will continue to write about them. And she may be canceled next week for all I know, but there is a way that she is authentically herself that I think is very healthy. (laughs) Do you know what I'm saying? And so I think, and so putting her on a shirt 
for this young, very smart Black teenager who has to navigate a world like Stuyvesant seems to be <laughs> a reminder, like, how much do you hold on to your authenticity? Now, you're asking me this question, but I wasn't consciously thinking about it because if I did, it would. but now I have to because you're asking me, but that's probably why. So because, and I love Beyonce, but if you put Beyonce on, it's not going to, it, it's a different conversation than putting Cardi B on. And yes. I'm, also, I'm fascinated too by, I try not to be judgmental. Like when people talk about hip hop, so many of the performers talk about work and how hard they work. And that can sometimes get lost in some of the other dialogues, which are valid dialogues, because there are challenges, right? But I'm personally struck by that, maybe because I'm always thinking about characters' jobs. So, yeah. I want to mention themes, because I do feel, even though you say you don't necessarily work with themes, there are themes, disappearance, disruption. Mm -hmm. And you've touched upon also that maybe some of these characters surprised you. I want to know one did you have an idea of where the story was going when you started? Like, did you have a vague idea? And then two, I'm a writer as myself, and very often they have an idea, a story, a plot, you're writing and you're working, you're in it. And then after a while you go, oh, I'm actually writing about this. And yeah, I guess I'm writing about that too. So how much self-discovery was there in terms of writing this from what whatever your original idea was to what ended up being this novel? I knew because I wrote daily cleanse so i knew they were going to go on a trip and i knew it was not going to go well and it was going to fall apart in some way that was going to disrupt their loved ones lives as well as their own but own lives but i didn't i didn't know all the pieces i didn't know uh, i i didn't know for example that this detective would come in and then when but when i knew a detective would come in i won't ruin it i thought mm, sometimes i know what i'm not going to do sometimes when you have a tough female detective they make her a stand in for a guy I'm going to do a different thing. I'm going to have this be a highly functional. She's not going to be an alcohol. I'm going to try some different things with this character, do you know? And or a neighbor. Oh, so this is the neighbor. What's the neighbor's story? That's usually how it starts. Oh, so it, this is this person. But what's this person's story? Okay. Same thing I said. I'm meeting him, her, or them today. What were they like? before and then what was the turning point in there in in that character's lives because we're usually subjected to sudden changes of fortune do you know <laughs> in this life and i'm always fascinated how do people handle uh, a sudden change of fortune will your worst demons come out or your better angels these are if i say i don't think about in terms of themes these are questions i ask on the way to maybe finding themes toward the end. Yeah. So last year, American Fiction came out. Oh, I, I love American Fiction and I love Percival Everett. <laughs> yeah. I wanted to get your thoughts on the state of publishing industry for you. Do you see a, a great future for writers of color to tell their stories of color in publishing in the next four to 10 years? Two things. Um, this isn't new. This usually happens in cycles, right? Um, during the Har Harlem Renaissance, let's go to the Harlem Renaissance. You had this intense interest in Black artists, and then there was a drought, right? I take strength from Percival Everett, and I have this discussion with other writer friends. I said, we just have to keep going. That man wrote how many books he just keeps going no matter what the trends are, no matter what's mm. popular, he tells the stories he wants to tell on his own terms. And honestly, seems to have fun doing. You had this period where there was keen interest. So it's shifting and 
things are drying up and then there'll be another period. But during that time, I would hope that we work collectively, we support one another. I also frame Toni Morrison. People often forget the Toni Morrison that we know. It was a long road to becoming that Toni Morrison because she wrote several books, right? And then I think it was Beloved and they went back and they reprinted those books. And now with Percival Everett, the man wrote, what, 30 books? And now he <laughs> they're reprinting those books. And if you're just looking at Percival Everett now, you think, oh, per but he's been working on his craft. And so you have to have a long view. And I might not be a quote unquote, great writer in my lifetime, maybe my job is to pave the road for the next great writer. And then my work might be rediscovered, you know, later. Now that means when you say checking your ego at the do door, it really does mean checking your ego at the door. But I think if you're going to write, you have to love writing and you care about characters and you don't want to write stereotypes. You really have to have a little bit of that approach. So that's my long-winded answer to the question. <laughs> That's a great answer. And I love everything you said about Percival Everett. And I definitely think he was writing about mm -hmm. one of those cycles mm -hmm. from the 90s where a certain kind mm -hmm. of novel was selling. You mentioned earlier that you're a teacher as well, and you teach writing. What advice or what things do you say, especially to young women of color who are starting out? I would say trust your gut and be open to criticism because you will get criticism and you will need feedback. And as I've said before, if you know everything, you're either a tyrant or a fool. So you can't know everything, but sometimes there has to be a, a gut check where you go, okay, I'm willing to make this change and this change, but no, 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 no. This is not a good one. <laughs> My ancestors wouldn't be happy with me if I made this change. So no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. And that's it for this episode of Brown and Black. If you would like to support this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. Your help will allow us to be heard by many more people. You can follow our comments and opinions on at Brown Black Podcast on Instagram, Threads, and YouTube. We'll see you on the next episode of, of Brown, Brown and Black. Black. $5 meal deal de McDonald's. Eliges entre McDouble o McChicken. Y además, obtienes papas y bebida pequeña y McNuggets de cuatro piezas. Es mucho McDonald's por no mucho dinero. Precios y participación pueden variar, solo por tiempo limitado. Con el $5 meal deal de McDonald's, eliges entre McDouble o McChicken. Y además, obtienes papas y bebida pequeña y McNuggets de cuatro piezas. Es mucho McDonald's por no mucho dinero. Precios y participación pueden variar, solo por tiempo limitado. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. Sponsored by Chumba Casino. No purchase necessary. VGW Group. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply.